Good Tuesday morning, everyone. It is Tuesday, I think. Yes, if we're here, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday, it's 1130 Mountain Time, and so I'm here to answer your questions. Monica Corrado, Ask the Gap Chef. Um, that's me. My website is Simply Being Well. <clears throat> Pardon me. And um, yay, happy to have you here, everyone. So again, my website, simplybeingwell.com. I do these every Tuesday morning, 1130 Mountain Time for one hour. I do try to teach uh, a bit of uh, every time we get started, about mm, 10, 15, 20 minutes on a topic, and then take your questions. You are welcome to uh, check out, please, um, the featured posts on the website so that you can find um, your free download of my GAPS intro diet chart. Free, free, free. Download it, print it, use it, all those good things. There's also a coupon for this book. All editions, that means print edition, um, Kindle edition, EPUB, all sorts of things for you. Um, yes, hello everyone. Just a quick disclaimer, as you know, I'm not a medical doctor. Nothing I say has been uh, approved by the FDA. Okay. And on we go. Onward, onward. Hello, Valerie. Hello, Vicki. Hello, Monica Wilson from Southern California. Give my love to the beach. Hello, Veronica from Hungary. How wonderful. I don't know if you know, but my mom was Hungarian, and uh, I hope to get to Hungary someday. Um, her dad came on the boat, right, in the early 1900s from Hungary. Hello, Vicky. Hello, 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 Adriana. Hello, Leonie. Leonie. I looked it up. Leonie. I hope I say it right. I'm sorry if I butcher everybody's name. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. All right. I want to talk about a couple things first before we start talking about um, fermenting meat. Yes. The first thing I want to do is someone asked me about, hello, Alejandra, about um, ridge in the fingernails, big ridge in the middle of the fingernails. Any ridge in your fingernails is a calcium deficiency. So that either means that you are not eating enough calcium or that you're not eating enough vitamin F, which is essential fatty acids, in order, <laughs> excellent, thanks. <laughs> um, you're not eating enough essential fatty acids in order to have your calcium go where it needs to go. Essential fatty acids, best source, butter, pastured butter. Did I say butter, 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 butter? Also fish oil, not cod liver oil, fish oil. All right, so I wanted to get that. Whoever it was who said I have ridges in my fingernails and I have a big ridge down the middle, and I said I'm not sure about middle, but the reality is we're talking about a calcium deficiency. Let's get some calcium. Uh, yeah, let's get some calcium going. All right, the next thing I'd like to go through is to show you some of my stock. Why not do a little show and tell? So just want to let you know. So this is a quart jar. This is chicken. Can you see what's happening? Let's see what happens here. Let's see how I did. I just opened one upstairs. So let's hope this is the same. Right? Yeah. Chicken meat stock. There you go. This is not bone broth. It's chicken meat stock. And I just wanted to show you that. It is possible. And uh, that is a lot of connective tissue in there, meaning um, I used the recipe, right? So we've got some backs. We've got some wings. We've got some necks. We've got some backs, wings, necks. Anything else? Legs. We've got a lot of skin. And we only have water about, I think I did an inch and a half, two inches max. Um, yeah, so that's what I've got. And I just wanted to show you 
how exciting and fabulous, right? I hope you can see it, that gelatinous <clears throat> meat stock is. All right. Hello, Joanna. Good morning. I think I'm going to see you later, maybe. Hello, Carol. Good morning. Hello, everyone. All right, I'm going to put the lid back on this baby and put it over here, and I will put it in the fridge later on. Now, how did I know my meat stock had done so well? Because I was making myself a mug. I've been I'm on clients all morning. I have an hour break between this and teaching the Certified Gaps Coach course. So this is my saving grace. Chicken stock, I threw in two eggs, um, good salt, a little bit of ghee, and I also, uh, yummy ghee, 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 with turmeric, and I also put in um, some of, actually, Tom Cowan. Dr. Tom Cowan sells a fabulous mushroom matrix. I think he calls it immunity matrix powder. Anyway, so that's what's in here. A lot of salt, good stuff. All right, what else did I want to tell you? Hello, Jana. Hello, Christina. Good to have you. Happy. Hooray. Say hello to Ontario, Canada for me. Yes. What is my opinion on canning meat stock? Canning is great. Um, so canning is high heat and high heat canning. I have found that my meat stock will can itself if I pour it hot into jars and uh, I put the lid on right away. What do you think of that? It's a great way to do it. All right. The other thing that, hello, Jody. Hello, Maria. Hello, Fatima is here also. So great to have everyone. I want to share something with you. I, yesterday I was about to cancel this live, but I want to share something with you. I'd like you to note my left eyelid. Can you see what's going on with my left eyelid? Yeah. I was going to try and make believe it wasn't going on, but it's going on. See how red it is? It's red and swollen. Actually, it's much better than it was yesterday for a lot of reasons, but... I wanted to share this with you as a teaching point. Why? How did Monica, that would be me, get a swollen left eyelid? I did not, this is not pink eye. My eye is fine. My vision is fine. It's not gritty. Nothing's going on here. I don't have anything going on except for swelling. So how did I get that? I'll tell you. Even I, the Gap Chef, Monica Corrado, can, will, can and will be affected by increasing the amount of kefir she has in her diet. So, just for fun, since I just taught a dairy class a couple weeks ago, and I had a ton, I still do, I had and have a ton of kefir uh, cream and uh, just regular good old milk kefir. I thought, ah, oh, let's just have more. So I probably tripled the amount of kefir that I have been drinking. And I did it over, I don't know, maybe two days, three days. And boom, my eye swell, swelled. Yes! What does that mean? That means that I have something going on. That means that I am changing the uh, microbial balance in my head. Yeah, my right eye is fine. This is not from dirty hands. This is not from, you know, petting the dog and then rubbing my, rubbing my eye. This is not a sty. Um, it's just a swollen um, eyelid. And so I wanted to share that with you. Why? So that all of you know that when we increase, when we triple the amount of probiotic foods that we have in our diet, things will move and shift. I mean, I've been gapsting, gapsing, gapsting. <laughs> I've been a gapster. I've been gapsing for what, 10 years? eight years, 10 years, long time. So for me to be having a response like this means that I am mixing it up and that actually makes me quite happy. So again, wanted to share that with you to show that everyone can have microbial um, shifts in their body and we never know what that's going to look like. Right now it looks like a swollen left eyelid on Monica. Um, it's not, I do not have anything going on on my skin. I'm not having any histamine responses. I didn't have any, so no rashes, no histamine responses, no diarrhea, no constipation, 
no migraines, no exhaustion, blip, 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 blip. What I didn't have, but what I did have was this. Interesting, right? I wanted to share that with you. So here I am in all of my humanity, in all of my imbalance, in all of my just being me with you today to show you that everyone, I keep doing this because the hair is getting on my eyelid and bothering me, um, that even the Gap Chef can overdo and have things shift. All right. So that's my sharing for today. Transparency. Why does Monica have a very, very um, swollen eyelid? Because she drank a lot of kefir. Kefir. And you know what? It was so yummy. And you know what? I'm continuing to do it. And how could I treat this? I can treat it with uh, slices of cucumber for the cool refrigerated so for the cool ah oh, that always feels so good and I can also use whey I can spray whey believe it or not on my eye it's a wonderful thing to do it's been helping what else can I do I have a homeopathic called ER911 it is a net remedy neuro emotional technique NET remedy called ER as an emergency 911 spraying a homeopathic on it and I'm also using some wonderful Paralandra flower remedies which are great all right so I just wanted to share that with you and let's see I hope I blew everybody's mind there hello Courtney hello Dawn hello Annika so great to have all of you with me today all right and everyone else who's not saying hello but you're watching uh, and anyone who watches this later on welcome welcome and good to have you with me and us. So, I wanted to talk about fermenting meat today. Why? Because it's cool, it's easy, it's awesome, it's delicious, um, and it really makes your food much more uh, easily digested. Yes, that sounds like a winner to me. Yeah. So Dr. Natasha talks about fermenting meat in the blue book. So we'll take the blue book out. Blue book. Hoping yours looks like this, like mine, right? Lots and lots and lots of let's figure this out together. So I even have one that says fermenting meat. Where is it? It is on page 251 in the blue book. We're talking about what we shall eat and why with some recipes. So literally, it's the second full paragraph. So how do we ferment meat at home? Wait, first I just wanna let you know, why ferment? I mean, why ferment? Why do we ferment ever? Because fermentation is a pre-digestion technique. And when we pre-digest anything, whether it's vegetables in kraut or vegetables in beets or pickles or vegetable medley, whether it's, um, you know, dairy, milk, or cream that we're fermenting, we're culturing, right, or meat, what's happening? Fermentation is a pre-digestion process. Whenever we pre-digest something, it means that it's going to be a lot easier on our digestive system. Less taxing to the digestive system, more nutrient available. Yes, we love that. Don't we love to have more nutrients available? Yes, yes we do. So what do you do? This is actually a twofer for you folks. I'm actually going to unveil two cool things. Of course, I'm going to talk about fermenting meat, but I'm also going to talk about how to make meat stock easily. This is not your typical recipe. It is in the blue book, and it is something that I covered in my meat stock class back in January, February. <clears throat> I think that's when we did it. Maybe it was February, March. I can't remember. That particular class, which was eight weeks, will be up on my website by August 1 for all of you to check it out. All right, so, so yes, fermenting meat, making meat stock a different way. What do you do? You take meat with a joint in it. Now, in the UK, joint, I'm putting it in quotes, see my little quotes? These are not rabbit ears, they're quotes. Joint means 
roast. Did you know that? Joint means roast. I always think of joint meaning, right? So there's joints in my fingers, there's joints here, there's joints in my shoulder, there's joints, joints, joints in my knee, or joints, no. Joint in the UK English, joint means a roast. So you take a roast with a bone in it. You take a roast with a bone in it, right? So for pork, this would be something called like a Boston butt. That's what we call it here, B-U-T-T. -T. It's also called a shoulder roast. Any of your shoulder roasts, bone in roast. You put it in your uh, Dutch oven, big one. Get a five to seven quart Dutch oven. Put your roast with a bone in it. It could be beef, lamb, pork, right? <clears throat> Game, I don't care, venison. Um, and you put it into your Dutch oven and you fill the Dutch oven up about two thirds with water, okay? And then you throw in lovingly, you can spoon in, you can fork in, you can throw in, take a handful if you want. I love to play with my food, I encourage you to do so of fermented vegetables and throw it into the Dutch oven. You can put two, for, two, two handfuls. Okay, so uh, you can do this with sauerkraut. You can do it with vegetables from Vegetable Medley. You can do it with kimchi. You can do it with any fermented vegetables that you have at home. It's not the brine, although you could, but it would kind of be a waste of the brine. Keep the brine to drink. So fermented veggies, so roast in Dutch oven, fill up two thirds with pure water, throw in handful or two. So what is that? Eh, it's probably about a cup ish, maybe more fermented vegetables. Okay, put the lid on, leave it on the counter for how long? I don't know. The longer we ferment, usually the better. You could leave it on the counter for six to eight to 12 hours. No problem, room temperature. If you're going to go longer than 12 hours, I'd probably put the whole thing in the refrigerator <clears throat> and take it back out and bring it up to room temperature before you put it in the oven. Okay, so um, one more time with feeling. How easy is this? Very easy. You use the fermented vegetables as your fermenting agent and then they become part of the roast, right? People just eat them. They don't even know they're there. Hooray. They don't even know that their meat is pre-digested. Hooray. Anyway, it works really well. It's, it's really delicious. And then when you're done uh, fermenting it, either on the counter or in the refrigerator, bring it back to temperature from the fridge. <clears throat> Put it into your oven. Pardon me. I like a low oven for this, folks. We're talking like I don't know. I, I like 270. Let's see what Dr. Tush is, just for fun. I like like 270, 275 for Fahrenheit, which is, what did she say? La, la, la. Look at that. Don't you love this? She also says, mm, mm, mm. Float, blah, blah, blah. Oh, now I'm on 252 blue. 252 blue. You can leave it in the fridge for a few days or at room temperature for a few hours. Right? It's just wonderful. Okay, so she has you doing it one of two, two ways. All right, so let me tell you. The first way that I'm telling you right now is get your roast, put it in a Dutch oven, fill it up two-thirds, Throw in a handful or two of fermented vegetables. Let it sit for six hours or so, or eight hours or 12 hours on the counter, then into a slow oven. All right. Another thing that Dr. Natasha is talking about is actually fermenting in brine. So what is that? That is when you take your roast of meat, right? And you put it into a glass clay. Uh, she says wooden bowl. I don't think wooden is a good idea with fermented vegetables, but... You use the brine and you make sure it's submerged and you let that ferment days in the refrigerator. Then you take it out of the brine and cook. All right, so there's two methods there. I hope I wasn't too confusing. Was I confusing? <clears throat> I hope I wasn't confusing. 
Anyway, ferment your meat. Try it. It's really yummy. Um, so someone asked, can I use... Car Hi, Caroline. Caroline says, what about beet kvass? Yes, if you want to use beet kvass to ferment your roast, um, again, I would do method two, which is put the roast in a glass bowl or a ceramic bowl, cover it with brine, or you can do brine and water, or you can do beet kvass, which is a tonic and water, cover it, put a plate on it to keep it submerged, <clears throat> the meat that is, and let it ferment in your fridge for two or three days. Take it out of the beet kvass and then roast as you would. Okay. Hello, Faduma is here. Yay. Hello, Phil Sand is here. Hello. Hello, Hala. Hope I'm saying that right. Hello, Carrie. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Lee. Lee is here. Wah, wah, wah. Wonderful. Okay, let's ask, see what the questions are coming in. Elizabeth says, with the first method, you leave the cooking liquid in when cooking. Yes. Yes, you do. That's the only one I've ever done, folks. I love it. I literally love it. I love to throw ferments in my meat. And so I'll get up in the morning and I'll take the roast out, the joint, right? Which is a roast with a bone in it. Um, I'll put that roast in my Dutch oven. I will fill it up two thirds, the Dutch oven up two thirds or two thirds of the way. You don't cover the roast. Two thirds of the way with water, I'll put in the fermented vegetables, one, two handfuls, put the lid on, leave it on my counter until I'm ready to cook. If you're doing the slow roast, slow cooking method in the, um, in your oven, it's going to be about three or four hours. Then you add your vegetables and then you go from there. Yes. Adriana asks, would you use stainless steel to ferment the roast with whey or only glass run? I don't really like, I mean, yes, you can use stainless steel. Stainless steel is non-reactive, so it should be fine. Um, I like, um, I personally like glass. I don't own, well, I mean, I guess I have Pyrex things that are quote unquote ceramic. So a Pyrex, a glass, those are my, my personal preferred um, vessels with, uh, for fermenting, if that makes sense. We know that glass is totally unreact non-reactive, unreactive, doesn't react. Um, that's why I like it so much. But stainless steel is probably fine. Lee asks, is corned beef a kind of fermented meat and is that allowed on gaps? Yes and yes. So corned beef is something that's corned. I know, not really. There's no corn in corned beef. Um, so... In the paragraph prior to her talking about fermenting meat, Dr. Natasha talks about um, marinating meat. So corned beef is a marinade. That is with, as far as I know, I've made it myself. Oh my God, the best ever. Don't ever buy it from a store again. God knows what they're putting in there, including something that call, turns it pink. Blah. Anyway, um, I think I put that recipe up on my blog or on my Facebook page, which would be simply being well. I think I did. I don't know if I did, but let me know if I didn't and I'll put it up. Um, corning is fermenting. Uh, pardon me. Corning is marinating. And so that's usually in water and acid of some sort. So water and vinegar and spices. Yeah. You could make a wonderful corned beef with soaking in whey and spices. Yum. I mean, that's going to, if you can tolerate dairy and you have extra whey, I would totally do that um, as opposed to vinegar. Why? It'll just be gentler on the meat, not dry it out. Just an idea. All right. What temperature in the oven? How long? Hi, Jody. So this is in the blue book. <clears throat> the temperature in the oven, again, I think I'm on 250, 252. Let me look. Whoa. That's what I get for balancing a spoon that I showed you my meat stock. And it fell. Oh, well. Now that, now something else is going to fall. Hold on. Let's see what she says. Ba -ba 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 boom, boom. Let's see. Yeah. So I would do like... Okay, one more time with feeling. We're talking about at least a three-pound roast maybe four, three to four pounds. It's usually a good, that's a good size roast for most people. Um, in a five to seven quart Dutch oven, um, I would do um, three to four hours at uh, 
275, which is about 275 is Fahrenheit is about 150, I'm guessing. I hope Mara is on watching me. Um, Celsius. And uh, so three to four hours and then throw in your vegetables. So what could it be? Brussels sprouts, carrots, onions, um, cauliflower, florets. I love this method. I've done it multiple times. I love that it's low heat because I can even do it in the summer. Yes, I know it is sometimes 95 and 100 here in Colorado, but at a low temperature, it's not gonna heat up your house, right? We're not talking 300, we're not talking 350, we're not talking 300, we're talking 275, low. You could even do it 250. If you go lower, the lower you go, obviously all of you fabulous cooks out there, we know the lower the oven temperature, the longer the cook, right? You have to add time. So Jody, I'd say, uh, if I'm doing a three to four pound joint, which is a roast with a bone in it, um, I would do, I personally would do somewhere between three and four hours at 275. And then I would throw in my cut up vegetables and I'd go another hour, another mm, half an hour to an hour, depending on what's going on, on with your roast. Check it, right? Obviously. That's what I would do. And it is yummy. In fact, I think I'll do it tonight. It's yummy. It's easy. People are always saying, yeah, I know Gaps asks a lot of you, but these are little tips and tricks. What happens? All that water you put in is meat stock. You eat the roast, you drink a mug of stock. It's right there in your Dutch oven. Easy, easy peasy. Okay. Hello, Gladys. Hello. Carol, hello, Carol. Does the roast need to be defrosted? Yes. The roast definitely needs to be defrosted if you're going to do this whole thing of like leaving on the counter from morning until 3 o'clock and then put it, no, maybe you want to leave it on the counter from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. and then put it in the oven. You're eating between 6 and 7 p.m. How long and what temperature for the crock pot? Oh, Elizabeth. Uh, let's see. I would look at, um, I would look in my book at all of the crock pot temperatures on meat stock chapter. Let's see if I can find it. So if you don't have it, where is it? Meat stock chapter, la la la. I'd look on page 42, handy meat stock chart. It tells you about using it uh, on, in a slow cooker. So, yeah. Usually I suggest to people that you do an hour on high to bring the temperature up and then, and then move it to low for the duration, somewhere between six and eight hours on low. That's my best. Off the cuff, yeah. Good? Okay. Hello, Monique. Hello, Hala. Hello, what else? Oh, Umo Samaya is here. You're welcome, Jody. Okay. If you have sulfuric SIBO and avoid sulfuric veggies and eggs, but for how long? Just slowly reintroducing. Mm, so everybody knows SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. And it's giving off a lot of sulfur smells. You can avoid the sulfuric, uh, you can avoid the veggies that give off sulfur smell. The ones that you're talking about, those are all your crucifers, right? That's cabbage, it's broccoli, it's ca um, cauliflower, it's garlic, and yeah, all those things. You can avoid them for a while. When I work with people with SIBO, I really try to make sure that their stomach acid is high enough is your stomach acid high enough? People, you must, please, just start drinking apple cider vinegar in water. You can put a tablespoon in eight ounces of water and just drink on it before your meals. Um, I keep thinking, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, I'm not talking. So we have to make sure our stomach acid is high enough so we don't have these bacterial overgrowths, right? So how long to stay off them? Yeah. I don't know. 
start with maybe two, three months and then start slowly introducing them, see what happens. But at the meantime, make sure your meat stock levels are very high, right? Do two or three months of very high meat stock for an adult. I don't know, this much meat stock a day. That's a quart, yeah. Um, and make sure you're working everything else. You're bringing in lots of probiotic vegetables. You're bringing in lots of, um, uh, make sure your stomach acid is high and then slowly introduce. Okay, do oxalates reform to a different structure when fermenting the beets? I know, everyone and your oxalates. Ay, ay, ay. So, just a quickie, just a quick reminder. Every time I'm on teaching with Dr. Natasha, she says, forget about these things. But, meaning, don't pay attention to oxalates. But if you really are having problems bringing in oxalates or foods that are high in oxalates, take them out of your diet for a while. Do more healing, more sealing, more meat stock, more fats. Next week, we're going to talk about fat. That's going to be fun. I better write that down. Next week, let's talk about fat and lots. How much? Fat, 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 fat. I'm writing it down. Fat. Yay. Okay. Um, so if oxalates do give you issues, like your joints hurt or whatever's happening for you, take them out of your diet for a while. What's a while? I don't know. Three to six months? Maybe longer. Depends on you. Watch your body. Listen. Lots of meat stock in the meantime. Lots of fat. Meat stock fat. Meat stock fat. Meat stock fat. Okay. In terms of beet kvass, I really encourage, well, in general, I encourage all of you on my page, on this page, on this group page, Ask the Gap Chef. When you first come on, use the search function to find out if we've talked about these things because we have talked about these things recently. One of our members wrote about oxalates and beets and beet kvass. So what do we know? We know two things. Well, we know a lot of things, but in terms of this, we know that if you cook the beets first, yes, you can cook the beets first, that will decrease the amount of oxalic acid in it. And secondly, when you ferment them, that will decrease the amount of oxalic acid in it. Both of those things. So make beet kvass, cook the beets first. You can roast them, you can, I would roast them. That's the best way. Roast or steam will retain most of the nutrients. You won't lose it to the water by boiling. And then ferment. Okay, let's see. What else do we have? Is egg high in sulfur? Avoid to. Egg is high in sulfur. Up to you. I mean, eggs are so, so nutritious and so important. So you can take them out for a month or two and then bring them back in. Slowly. We always bring them back in slowly. Everything comes in slowly. Little tiny bits, sometimes the amount that fits on the head of my pencil. Right? Yes. If you want to, make some choices. Decide what you want to keep out. Like, for example, you might want to keep out Hala. You might want to, I hope I'm saying your name right. You may want to keep out all of the vegetables that uh, are high in sulfur and see if that's enough. Uh, if it's not enough, then take out the eggs too. And then decide what you're going to bring in slowly after two to three months of healing. That's what I would suggest. Hello, Roseanne. You're welcome. All right, let's see. Monique asks, my two-year-old seems to get crabby after giving apple cider vinegar in water before meals. Why would this be? Well, so the first thing, Monique, is to make sure you're not giving your two-year-old too much vinegar in water, right? It doesn't need to be very, very vinegary. Maybe it's too strong for him. Um... Apple cider vinegar is acidic, and so maybe he's experiencing some die-off from the apple cider vinegar. It's a very, very good thing for people to be drinking, but that's possible. So I would either look at the dilute, like dilute the amount and see if you get a change. Um, yeah, maybe your two-year-old doesn't actually need apple cider vinegar in water. 
sweet little two-year-old. Just a thought. Might be too strong for him. Hello, Efren. Woohoo! Efren is on. Okay. Anybody else have questions? We've got time for questions now. Oh, Vic Vicky has a question. Sorry. Hi, Vicky. Okay. Vicky says, what do you recommend to get more calcium if cultured dairy causes anaphylactic reactions? Oh boy. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, the first thing that I would suggest is that you, um, Continue healing and sealing and continue the GAPS diet and continue the amount of meat stock you're taking in and, you know, gelatin, cartilage, um, fats, fermented foods. Keep healing, keep healing, keep healing because we also know that there are cases where anaphylactic uh, reactions have been cleared by GAPS. So I'll put that out there. Um... What would I suggest for calcium? So we know uh, that really there's not a heck of a lot of calcium in bone broth or meat stock. There just isn't, folks, in terms of um, making up for the bioavailable calcium of fermented or cultured dairy. And there really isn't a heck of a lot of calcium in leafy greens like kale and chard and... And we know that kale has a problem uh, the additional challenge of kale is uh, it is uh, a goitrogen, meaning it can suppress your thyroid. So I would move to supplements. That's what I would do. Uh, backing up one moment. Before we go to supplements, I would make your meat stock. Uh, I would... Uh, I would be eating the bones of fish, meaning I would get salmon. Um, I know, I'm gonna say canned salmon. I know cans is not the best, but you get this idea, right? Cooked salmon, salmon in sustainable salmon, salmon that's not, that salmon that is wild, caught. When you eat the little bones of the salmon uh, spine, there's calcium for you. That's one idea. Uh, number two, another good idea is to take eggshells from all these beautiful eggs you're eating and make your own high calcium vinegar. High calcium vinegar is made from clean eggshell, so apple cider vinegar, clean eggshells, and then other things like nettles. Um, and I'm not even sure of what the other ones are. I know nettles, eggshells, not sure what else, but you can make your own high calcium vinegar. Um, it takes about, mm, I'm, I hope I'm not misspeaking, three to six months. Uh, I'll put the recipe up or a recipe up on our making a note calcium vinegar. So the way that we get calcium is from eggshells. So you can make high calcium vinegar, then you can use that on your salads, right? You can drink it in water, all sorts of good things like that. I'll put that recipe up. Um, the bones of fish, you can pulverize them. I'm not talking about big fish people. I'm talking about little, tiny, tiny, little, tiny bones, right? So um, if you get, uh, what am I thinking of? Is it herring? No. Sardines? Yeah. Eat them. Eat bones and all. Sardines. Um, what else is high in calcium? Tahini, sesame. Sesame seeds are high in calcium. I taught a high calcium class for women a long time ago at least 15 years ago now. So let's see what we could do about high, high calcium, not uh, not dairy. Uh, maybe I'll write a blog about this soon and I'll let you know. But in the meantime, let's talk about high calcium vinegar, eating the bones of little tiny fish. Um, obviously you do not want to eat bones that are going to puncture anything on the way down, right? You pulverize them, um, you chew them really well. These are bones that are so soft that they crumble in your hands like this. All right, that's what I'm thinking. I hope that's helpful, Vicki. Okay, let's see. Annika says, are you afraid of listeria bacteria and raw milk or raw milk kefir? I try not to be afraid of anything because fear feeds on itself and you just get frightened of everything, right folks? So 
Uh, no, I'm not afraid, Annika, of um, listeria. Certainly not in raw milk kefir. So what is why? First of all, we want to make sure that um, we want to make sure. Hold on, I'm seeing anchovy question. Give me a second. We want to make sure that our raw milk is coming from a clean source. If they're testing the way they need to be, you should have no problems whatsoever. In the U.S., raw milk dairies are held to a much higher standard than uh, pasteurized dairies or dairies that are going to go send their milk to be pasteurized. Why? Because raw milk dairy, raw milk needs to be clean or you're going to get sick and then they're out of business, right? Milk that goes to pasteurized, that's going to be pasteurized, can be full of garbage, full of, you know, just horrible things. But they're going to pasteurize it, so they don't really care. Oops. That's bratty and snarky of me, right? So, no, I'm not afraid of listeria in raw milk or raw milk kefir. We know that, uh, I can't say this like Annika. I don't know the study, but I'm sure if we got on, um... I'm not sure. I'm hoping if we look, we could find that the yeasts in kefir will destroy any bacteria that would be problematic and pathogenic. That is why Dr. Natasha is even saying in the blue book that you do not have to heat pasteurized milk to make kefir. Okay, so if you have a concern, first of all, so let me just go over that again. <clears throat> Number one, if you have... Uh, your first protection is making sure you're getting raw milk from a clean dairy. You should be able to walk into that dairy and talk to those farmers and they should be able to show you all their testing and be like, hey, yeah, we're good, we're clean, everything's fabulous, come eat the cows. That's your first protection. Number two, don't drink the raw milk if you're concerned. Make kefir because our understanding, certainly Dr. Natasha's, is that kefir the yeast and bacteria in kefir are so powerful that they will destroy anything that is that could be problematic. I hope that helps. Hello, Uma. Uma is here. Hello. Okay, let's see. Carol says, my son has had seasonal bad seasonal allergies. Hold on, I'm going to drink some of my meat stock with two eggs and mushrooms in it. Hold on. A little bit. Caps mm -hmm. is helping him so much, but he had a major backslide. Excellent. Sorry. Backslides are not fun, people. We know it in terms of symptoms. They're a bummer. But when we have a backslide or we have a something like this show up, right? That means things are moving. Things are working. Yay for another layer of healing. Any suggestions for helping relieve symptoms in the short term while we, while we work the diet? So bad seasonal allergies. So I would look at things like nettles, nettle tincture, uh, N-E-T-T-L-E, -T -T -E, nettle. Uh, that's stinging nettle, stinging nettle tincture, stinging nettle tea, stinging nettle soup. Dr. Natasha has a recipe of nettle soup in both of her, both yellow and blue books. Um, I would be loading up on the nettles because nettles have a natural, quote-unquote, antihistamine response. Uh, that's what they do. They're also high in calcium, so yay. Uh, what else can you do for this backslide? La, la, la. Raw honey. How much raw honey is he taking? He should be having the honey and the, um, <coughs> pardon me, chewing the, um, chewing the wax, eating the propolis, all of it. Propolis. Local raw honey is best. I would be doing both of those things for your sweet child. Um, what else for seasonal allergies? Nettles is like number one. Raw honey is right up there. And frankly, everyone, if you have seasonal allergies, it would be a great idea if you started two to three months in advance of the season, like next year. Two to three months in advance, start loading up on nettles, nettle tea. You can drink a cup, two cups, three cups a day. You can make nettle soup, etc. Um, you can take nettle tincture, and uh, you can also start with the honey. That's like a honey uh, remedy, if you will. All right. Would anchovies be good for calcium? 
Uh, yes, eat them. Eat them, but you don't have to eat a lot of them because they're so little. Like, I can eat a whole can of anchovies at a time. My favorite are the ones with capers, right? Yes, can. I know I said that. Um, but certainly, uh, anchovies, eat them for sure. That would be grand. Yep. All right. Lee says, hello, Lee. The realmilk.com site has a ton of studies on how clean raw, yes, raw milk is safe. Excellent. Thanks for that. Reminder, Lee, thank you. I love therealmilk.com. I'm telling people to go there all the time. You're welcome, Carol. Let us know how it goes. <clears throat> I love that link too. RustinAPrice.org. New studies confirm raw milk a low-risk food. Amen. I've been saying it for years. All right. Let's see. What does Jana say? Hello, Jana. I hope I say your name right. I'm working on bringing candida into balance, and I'm working on drinking lots of kefir. Should I be avoiding berries? Yes. I've cut out all fruit of my di out of my diet for a couple of years now and would love to be able to have some fresh berries while in season as long as it won't set me back. So I said yes right away, didn't I? Kind of bratty of me. Um, berries have so many good things. We know, yeah. So here's what I would do. Um, personally, I would suggest staying away from strawberries and raspberries. Go for the dark colored berries. They tend to be lower in sugar, right? So start with blue or black or boysenberry, those types of things. And just, uh, yeah, see how you do. Um, with how much? Always we're watching. What can the body tolerate? Um, yes, I know it's seasonal. So fresh seasonal berries have a lot of good healthful things. Plus, doesn't it feel wonderful to throw some berries in your kefir? Yes. Yes, it does. So, you know, one more time with feeling, everyone. You're doing berries. Make sure you're not doing too many berries. Make sure, you know, you're not doing like a cup and a half of berries a day. You're just doing, maybe you're doing like a handful or quarter cup or, you know, just watch the amount you're bringing in. And uh, good luck with bringing candida into balance. Remembering that it's kefir and meat stock. Those are your big tools against kefir yay great you're welcome i know plain kefir is high if plain kefir is hard then you're probably fermenting it too long i gotta tell you i had a lot of great kefir make make kefir cream it's yummy it's not sour if it's too sour or it's too strong ferment it a little bit less okay so it shouldn't be hard it shouldn't be hard. It should be easy. It should be like, yep, here we go. Drinking it. Yum, yum, yum. Okay. Anyone else have questions? Did I not get any questions? Oh, Monique. Monique Alice Marie. He had severe silent reflux as a baby, but has gotten better after starting gaps. Excellent. Excellent. I'm happy. I would watch the amount of apple cider vinegar you're giving a two-year-old. Yeah, I would be doing other things. Give him more meat stock. Give him some cabbage tonic juice. Give him some, um, yeah, beet kvass. Give him some pickle juice, you know, things like that. But I would probably maybe just lay off the, um, maybe just lay off the, uh, the apple cider vinegar for a two-year-old right now. All right, Faria is here. Hello. Sent message too soon. Kefir cream is amazing. Yes, kefir cream is amazing. Hello, Noor. Noor Asma. Maybe it's Noray. I don't know, but in any case, hello, hello, hello. All right, we've got a few minutes. Does anybody have any other questions about anything? Fermenting meat, fermenting veggies, all sorts of things. I could just start spouting off little things. That would be wonderful for people. Go. All right, let's see. Mm -hmm. I'm just scrolling, scrolling and singing. La la la, okay. All right, so what else do we need? We've got a few minutes left and I can answer whatever you'd like. Um, mm -hmm. Look for that high calcium vinegar on the page. 
I will get that recipe for you and to you for sure. Um, what else? And next week we're going to talk about fat. We could talk about how much fat, why fat, render fat, etc. All that good stuff. Okay. Ah, there's Mia. Hello, Mia. What type of tea would you start with a 21-month-old? Hmm. I would start all of them. Uh, I'd probably start chamomile. Chamomile is good. Uh, you can absolutely... So of the three teas that we talked about a couple weeks ago, th top three teas for gaps, okay? All tea, you can drink tea on gaps. You cannot drink black tea on gaps, everybody. You cannot drink tr green tea on gaps. So we're talking about herbal tea only. So herbal tea, herbal tea, herbal tea, herbal, herbal, herbal tea. Um, you're looking for organic, non-irradiated, clean tea. No fillers and things, right? The three top teas are chamomile, peppermint, and fresh ginger tea. With a 20-month, one-month-old, you will, uh, you can absolutely do any of those teas with that child and uh, see how he does, right? They all have their different gifts and we know that ginger, the biggest thing for ginger is digestion, meaning motility, but you can try all of them and see how he does. You're welcome, Vicki. Efren says, can one come on and come on and come off gaps for a year? Sure, you can come on and off gaps whenever you want. Um, uh, so in my book, I talk about the well diet, which is the Weston A. Price diet. Um, it is in the book on the page. Let's see. Here's the book. You all know that. You have it, Efren, I'm sure. At home. Let's look. Yeah. Section 11. What to eat after gaps. The well diet of Weston A. Price and nourishing traditions. So, um, I never suggest that people go from gaps to the standard American diet because it's horrible and it's very high carb and it will set you right back. I'm not God, but I'm just saying, in my opinion, it will set one, a person, right back into uh, fungal overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, uh, candida, all sorts of things, uh, microbial imbalance, blah, blah, blah. So, what do you do? Um, my and Dr. Natasha's best suggestion is full gaps diet. Plus, you can start adding in some, when you're ready, that's also called the transition diet. You want to transition off, right? Transition off gaps. Um, some fermented grains. Yeah, there's a whole list of them and how to do it. Um, but I have to tell you, folks, I really believe that full gaps is the way to go for the rest of your life. Meaning, what's full gaps? Meat, any kind of meat cooked any kind of way. Fish, same. Poultry, same. Vegetables, any kind of veggies except for potatoes and except for um, other starchy veg. Yeah. So, so meats, vegetables, cultured dairy, fats, every darn thing. You can have nuts, you can have seeds, you can have fruit, you can have... I mean, there's so many things on full gaps. It's almost like, really? The only thing you're not eating on full gaps is uh, grains, uh, bread, grains, bread, pasta, right? So if you want to move to full gaps, maintaining meat stock two or three times a week, maintaining fermented vegetables every day, maintaining cultured dairy is the only dairy you eat, Maintaining uh, clean food, all organic, no GMOs, no pesticides, no CRAP, right? And then you want to branch into, I want to try some sourdough. Yeah, that's fine. Wonderful. But we never go off, I mean, up to you always, but who would ever want to go back to the, I'm looking for the word, sickening, uh, nutrient deficient, diet of the standard American diet. 
I wouldn't. I haven't. All right. What are we at? I went off gaps for the 4th of July weekend and I paid for it. Yep, completely constipated today and had to do an emergency enema. Well, God bless you, Efren, that you know that you can do an enema and that you can get relief. We all know enemas are the number one relief from constipation. Saying it clearly to my whole audience, enemas are the number one relief to constipation. No one should be constipated. No one. Everyone needs to have at least one bowel movement a day. So... I hear you, Efren. Saltines for what? Crackers, question mark, saltines. Can you eat saltines? No, you can make your own crackers on gaps. Again, why would we go to sourdough? Because sourdough is pre-digested grain. That's why sourdough. If you're going to go to grains when you transition off, they must be sourdoughed or they must be so, so soaked or sprouted or fermented, and fermented grains are sourdough, right? Can one do full gaps forever? Absolutely. You're welcome, Efren. I hope you're doing better over there. Okay, let's see. See you tomorrow. Mia says, you're welcome. No green tea. What about Jun? Jun uses green tea to make, right, the Jun. It's an ingredient, but you don't just sit there drinking green tea. You don't drink green tea, you don't drink black tea, you don't drink coffee, right? I'm wrong, on full gaps, you, once you've graduated to full gaps, you can have weak coffee. That means you can see through it, by the way. Okay, let's see. Da, 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 da. Mia says, one whose biggest issues is eczema and issues, oh, eczema and itching for the littlest tiny. I'm thinking eczema and itching. I would try baking soda baths for that child and see how that works. That's where I would go for sure. Yep. I know it was for the tea question, but I'm telling you the bath answer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, for the tea question, eczema. Yeah, I mean, really what you're doing, none of those teas are quote unquote going to help with his eczema. It's not going to help with his itching, but... Um, uh, chamomile is a nervine. It's calming. Um, I would also think about lemon balm for your child. Calming, another nervine, wonderful. Um, I would be doing topical things for the eczema, like honey on the eczema or kefir on the eczema. Dr. Natasha has lists of things to put on topically. Nettles, sure. You can try nettle tea. Yep. That would be fine. Thank you for that. Yep, nettle tea for that baby. Absolutely. Good, good. Nettle tea. I love it. Faria says, Is it normal to see white crystals forming whilst making beet kvass? I use beetroot water and Himalayan salt. Where are the crystals? Are they on top or are they floating on the bottom? Where are the crystals? I would need to know that. Um, I'm not sure that it's normal. I don't think I've ever seen crystals, but let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. Right? Okay, let's see, let's see, let's see. Good, good. If you have that question... Oh, Adriana says, on top, crystals on top. Crystals, like if you took your spoon, it would come off as crystals. Oh my God, Sandor Katz was in the Netherlands. Oh, that's wonderful, Annika, I love that. Okay, on top, if you have crystals on top. Hello, Lucia. Okay, um, I would, Faria, I would uh, check all the things about the recipe. So did you put in enough salt, one to two tablespoons? Uh, did you have it at the right temperature? Did you only fill to the shoulder of the... Um, of the jar did you leave it out with tight cap all those types of things um if you see crystals mm, i would try to scrape it off it may be calm yeast that's my best guess calm yeast k-a-h-m is fine will not hurt you you can't yeah whitish substance okay so um that's probably calm yeast k-a-h-m you should be able to scrape that off and throw it out and then drink the beet kvass. Um, it can also be harmless yeast, by the way. 
Uh, could also be milk solids from your whey, but you didn't use whey. So, yep. <laughs> okay. Hi, Shirley Early. Okay, let's see. How much salt per pound of meat bone for stock? I don't salt mine. Dr. Natasha does, and that's fine. I, uh, I would, you know, again, I'm a cook like this. Da -da 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 -da. So take some and ch -ch 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 throw some in. I, uh, yeah, I wouldn't be really measuring salt. I don't know. How many, how much salt per pound? I don't know. Somewhere between, so for a whole meat stock of three pounds, somewhere between a teaspoon. I'd start with a teaspoon, see how it tastes. Could go up to two or three teaspoons, depending on what. Okay, how, this is my last question, folks, because I have to teach in less than an hour with Dr. Natasha. Does kvass made with whey ferment quicker than just, of course, what do you think? Leonie, what do you think? Hello, Nina. Yes, of course. Why? Anything that you use uh, whey, whey is a starter. Starter makes things go faster, whether it's whey or it's a starter packet. So yes, it will go faster than just salt. Okay, last question. I'm really going to answer. Oh, I'm going way up here to Adriana. Adriana, where are you? Adriana, where are you? Adriana, Adriana. Ah, how often should we do the stomach acid test if we started taking Zypan? So, how often should we do the stomach acid test? So let's put it this way. Zypan is not going to correct the ability for your body to make stomach acid. Zypan is stomach acid or is, right? So... It's really about getting your stomach to produce the acid. And that is, that's a healing process. How do we get your stomach to start producing more stomach acid? Sometimes that's about less stress. Yeah. Uh, how much stress do you have in your life, right? So reducing stress. Um, sometimes it's about getting more B vitamins in so the body can actually make the stomach acid. That's a complicated answer. I can't give you the whole thing right now. So that's liver, 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 liver. How much liver are you eating? So we need to think about the mechanism of getting your stomach to produce more acid, if that makes sense. People that are taking hydrochloric acid or stomach acid boosters are not doing something that's helping the stomach to start producing more acid. What it's doing is adding acid. So we need to look at that and see about how do we get your stomach, let me write that down. How do we get the stomach to produce more acid? The other thing is that as you age, I know you're a lot younger than I am, Adriana. 57. Uh, as you age, your stomach starts producing less and less acid. So let me look at that and then we can go from there. I hope that's helpful. I hope you followed me there. Hello, hello. All right, everyone. I need to scoot because I need to teach the Certified GAPS Coach class uh, this afternoon. I wish you all well. I thank you for coming to be with me today. I hope you're getting, uh, I hope the page is serving you well. I hope you're getting some good answers. I hope these lives are serving you. And I wish you a very good week. Take care of yourselves. No, try to look at gaps as a nourishing, nurturing way of life as opposed to a diet that you need to do. Yeah? Okay. Be well, everyone. Blessings. We'll see you next week. You're welcome.